relationship Talking like I've been the shit Who are you to benefit? This is my guilty conscience Trying to play innocent Fuck with me, I dare you Go through failures, losing energy Got a game on men I'm why they killing me You're kidding me I can't take another L Young and too competitive We got it, just gotta stay Far away from negative, yeah Positive, positive, think positive Every time they check come in Gotta deposit it Every time them overs get counted Gotta deposit it Every time they lick come in I'ma deposit it, yeah Positive, positive, think positive Every time that wall get built Gotta demolish it Every time they come with that fake Throw them that modest shit Every time you come out the negative Homie, honor it, yeah Positive, positive, think positive Positive, positive, think positive Positive, positive, think positive Every time they check come in Gotta deposit it Good vibes only Good vibes only We don't wanna listen to them hood rhymes only Motivate me, make me feel like I got a chance I just want the city to feel me Feel like they got no hands I just want my father to feel like he don't raise a man Stop taking losses, we're out of town Let's throw us some grants Damn, all my niggas about to be millionaires New veneers, I'm just smiling at these evil stairs Keep it playing, stay prepared They just want to scare Fuck it though, we live in dreams with no single cares yeah, repetitive, gotta keep it repetitive We got it, we just gotta stay far away from the negatives yeah. Positive, positive, think positive Every time they check come in, gotta deposit it Every time them overs get counted, gotta deposit it Every time they lick come in, I'ma deposit it yeah. Positive, positive, think positive Every time they wall get built, gotta demolish it Every time they come with that fake, throw them that modest shit Every time you come out the negative, homie, honor it, yeah Positive, positive, think positive Positive, positive, think positive Positive, positive, think positive Every time they check come in, gotta deposit it to the rocky road a show hosted by me um in association with crowded streaming i am here today with mr Derek rhodes of black label record uh, black label music <laughs> recording studio yes yeah just black label black label is just fine with black label that's yeah. a dope name bro Appreciate so, it. Um, this show is a show that revolves around music artists, independent music artists, and the people who are in the industry who support them. Um, I am so happy to have you here today, Mr. Rhodes. We Likewise. see each other online all the time and we have like uh yet to have a sit down and we are in the middle of shutdowns and COVID-19 and I am so glad that you made time for us here today. Why don't you tell everyone a little bit about your your history as a, a producer? Okay so um, where do I start? My name is Derek Rhodes. Um, start, start when you were a kid. What made you decide <laughs> that you were going to be a producer and this was going to be your lane? The thing that made me decide that I was going to be a producer was The Chronic by Dr. Dre. Um, I was like, man, how does he do this? Like, I didn't realize he did everything. He was, I didn't realize he was recording the music, 
mixing the music, looping up the drums. You know, right now it's a more simpler time where you get, you're using everything digitally, but before they were splicing tape, I'm glad I don't have to deal with none of that because it'd probably be so much money. But that project, when I was probably in the ninth grade, because I've been listening to it for since I was in the fifth grade, but that project is the one that made me decide um, I wanted to be a producer. Um, you know, I've always loved music. My family's not really a musical instrument playing type, but we uh, we like to party and our family likes to uh, listen to music. So I grew up listening to Parliament Funkadelics, um, the Isley Brothers. With my grandmother, it was Al Green, Bobby Bland. And my grandmother was actually pretty relaxed with the music. She would let me listen to whatever I wanted to listen to. She saw something in me a long time ago. She actually bought me a keyboard um, because I told her I wanted to do music. So, uh, but what is so much, so deep, so far, Michael Jackson is an influence. I could like go on forever. I just, I'm afraid to talk so much that I'm gonna be talking in circles. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, our family loves music. My first experience with hip hop was my cousin, Kim, she, put um she would play the beastie boys run dmc ll cool j so yeah i mean it, it, it's all over the place i would have to literally write every single thing down mm. to let to give you like every specific detail i had three older female cousins and they all had different musical tastes so the cousin that i just described she liked real raw hip-hop like the Beastie Boys, like anything, Paul Revere was like one of my favorite songs when I was a little kid. That was actually um, a song by the Beastie Boys on License to Ill. Very that, you know that beat? So that's, yeah. one, of the, that's one of the songs that, um, that influenced me a lot, especially with that bass and it was hidden. Another cousin of mine, she put me on gangster rap like Ice Cube, uh, the DOC, Snoop Doggy Dog. She had these tapes. And I wasn't supposed to listen to them with nobody, but one day she was babysitting, she picked me up and she had all these tapes in her car. This is what she listening to on the way to work and on the way to school. And then one day she picked me up and that's what made me say, man, this is good music. It's actually good music front to back. These are projects. And I try to put together projects that I work on with artists in the way some of these projects are st structured now. And my other cousin, she was more into the soft side of music, the LL Cool J rap or Key Sweat, the slow stuff, the sensual type of music. Because when I say LL Cool J, I mean like I Need Love. That was a very special song at that time. It was nothing like it. The beat was so different. Um, and and yeah, like I said, Keith Sweat. Women love Keith Sweat back in the day. Joe, I love Keith Sweat. People shit and on one twelve. <laughs> they be shitting on his voice, but his voice was like "Make It Last Forever" is a classic album. It's perfect. It no is. Flaws. You know, I I don't make fun of his voice until we hit the twisted song, but. The good news is I could play both the female and the man. Uh, uh, well, not the female, but the group that sang on it and both. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, see, because he was kind of whining. He was like more in his, baby. He was up in his yeah, nose. Yeah, baby, baby, baby. Okay, y'all. Yeah, so it's like, <laughs> I feel that. But when he when he's singing on um, Make It Last Forever with Jackie McGee, that's a mm. beautiful song. It's a yeah, great that duet. Is Song. And um, the first song on the album, Something Just Ain't Right, that song mm. is a great song. Like every song on there is good. Mm. And um, that's uh, that kind of music influenced me a lot because it let me know, even looking back, I wasn't even in a relationship then, but I can sing that type of music or sing some Jodeci without feeling some kind of way. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, you what, know? what? took you into 
production and and where did you get your training when you decided to be a producer all right so first i was a dj um i was like a uh you know just a cd dj i didn't have access to a lot of things i didn't have access to turntables i didn't have a job i was young i played football in high school so you have to make a decision i, I love football i still do so you know every sunday i wake up and watch it um saturdays i'm watching college ball but you know at that time specifically i could not do both i couldn't work for you know i just gave myself the chance to be a kid i did things that were fun you know i it's a funny story my college i mean my, my high school um football coaches got upset with me because i didn't come to two days because i went to spend some time with a friend of mine because we were supposed to be working on music out of town when i was in high school so they punished me by making me play JV an extra year because I didn't do two a days, which is understood because when you play football, you got to be dedicated. It's something that is very, you have to be intellectual. You got to have a high IQ. So they, that's how they punished me. They thought they were punishing me, but I've made, you know, decent money making music, not a whole lot, but I, you know, I can make a living doing what I do, you know? But um, back to the original question, I started off as a DJ. And from there, I was DJing a party for a cousin of mine out in, um, in Anderson, Texas. And, you know, it's the country out there. It's just like freaking Egypt or something, but, you know, it's in the dead middle of nowhere. One of my cousins out in the country, I went to his house. He had a program called Fruity Loops. So I started using Fruity Loops out in the country of all places. I had no idea how I was going to be a producer. I didn't even think that um, being a producer was going to be, it was going to be so difficult. I didn't know anything about NPCs or anything like that. I didn't learn about that until I started, started going out and seeing, um, going to the guitar center when I started buying the uh, buying Fruity Loops because I had to buy it in the store. I couldn't buy it online. There was no, I mean, there there was online at the time, but I was not very internet savvy. I just put, I installed it at, at home. It was nothing to download it at home. I had from to, Apple Store or yeah, Google you know, there store. was like, and I'll tell you like this. And I must, I'm gonna age myself a little bit, but in 2000, <laughs> uh -oh. 2001, in 2001, I remember going to the guitar center on Westheimer and buying um, Fruity Loops in the box. That's how I had to. That's how I had to do it. I actually put it on layaway because I was poor. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't. How much it. was it? Do you remember? I think it was like 120 something. It wasn't mm. expensive. It's, it's it wasn't expensive at all. But, you know, my mom, she questioned me. She's like, why are you spending your money on that? Why are you doing that? You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, oh, I've got to deal with this. I went and bought a computer. I made sure I got me a little PC that could run music on it. I was downloading MP3s, like buying sounds. They used to sell like sounds at the guitar center on CDs. So any of my drum samples and stuff, I didn't know anything about chopping samples at the time like using a turntable to get your sounds into the sampler and none of that. I had to just basically do it the, do it my own way. And just, I didn't know anything about sampling, looping up anything. It was just basically using synthesized sounds that were in the, um, that were in the program. There was no extra, uh, you know how you can download new plugins and things and stuff now? I didn't know anything about that. I didn't do it. I just, I was like, you know, I don't, I ain't download nothing. Cause I, I did, the internet was such a new place that, you know, I was downloading things. I was getting viruses on my computer. Oh, Jesus. It was, <laughs> it's, it was, it's been a journey. It's been a journey. It has been a real journey. 
But yeah, so I was introduced to production by my cousin on accident. It was an accident, honestly. I did not know that I was going to be a producer. My journey was never to be a producer or beat maker. I was going to be a DJ, you know, and I was working in the meantime, you know, working at Smoothie King and stuff like that, working at the Compact Center at Airmark, you know, putting nachos in um, trays for people to come watch the Rockets and watch these Mary J. Blige concerts and stuff like that. You were still in the industry. <laughs> and, you know what? I saw my first beat a long time ago. It was like 200 bucks. You know, so, and I think I overcharged that dude because I ain't heard from him. You know, people ain't selling beats now for $200. They sell them for 50 And I'm yeah. out here. And that's not good. <laughs> I mean, on the lease. Yeah, I mean, did he get exclusive? Well, we don't really know for back then, right? It was like, I mean, it was no, it was what just, you do with it is what you do with it. Yeah, it was just whatever. I gave him all the sounds, but he never did anything. He never really um, developed into a talent. You know, he was a little, he was older than I was. He's a guy from Chicago. He's a friend of mine's. He's my younger brother's friend's older brother. So mm. my brother. Mm. That's As a, a lot of a, a lot of long way down. Well, you my younger brother, he he actually went to West Side. You probably would know him. But um he um had a friend named Lance, and Lance had an older brother. The older brother is the one who came by and he bought the beat from me. So, and that was back when we were on um on Ridge in um in on Glenmont on the Southwest Houston and on Chimney Rock. So yeah, it was a while ago. Mm. Mm-hmm. Man. Is I mean, there's so much that I could talk about. Like and even being even having a studio, this was not a goal of mine. It was something out of necessity. We actually started the studio so that we could not be in our parents' house while we bring client bring our friends over to rap. You know, this was not, this was for the artists. We weren't trying to charge people for, to rap. We were just doing it. We were paying for studio space so that we could get our friends over and we could start developing talent. And when I say we, my business partner, who was Rodney Crowder, um, we would just spend all night in the studio, um, at our houses and then you know we'll be up till six in the morning working on a mixtape working on beats we did so much in such a small amount of time we went from working on our artists to um spending time with horseman you know horseman horseman records yes well i don't okay. know him personally but yeah i know of you know of him yeah all right so we actually started working with him um, at his studio that was on West Park, right down the way from Scores, the strip club Scores. We would go over there to the strip club for a little while, then we would go back to the studio um, to work on music for an artist by the name of Info. And um, we met, we ran into a whole lot of people. We worked with Zero there. We work with Chopper Style. We work with Lennox, um, Louis Rankin from Belly um, with, reg- with regards to this project that we're working on for this artist. Like, that's when I told you that it's gonna be a lot of different things that I could talk about. There is so much little detail that I have to put in order in my brain. So if it seems like I'm all over the place, pardon me, you know? But we worked over there with him for about a year. You know, we had the opportunity to record and produce a song called Gun Talk, which Zero jumped on. And it was actually kind of a local hit. Um, G-Man uh, was actually using our music. They were playing the song on um, 97.9 The Box, you know, Straight From The Streets. Uh, Mad Hatter, uh, G-Man was talking over the instrumental. Uh, you know, during his, um, you know, when he's doing his segments and whatnot. 
you know, one day I was in um, foot action and I'm like, is that our, is that our beat? They playing our beat on the radio? <laughs> you know, I got excited. I was like, hold on, wait a minute, fam. Um, so yeah, where, where else can I go? It's, we worked with, like I said, people like Lennox. He was a good person to work with. He, he didn't actually rap, but um, he actually did like the interludes for the mixtape that we did for Info which is hosted by DJ G2 is a very good mixtape, but you know, because of independence, you know, people operate out of fear a lot of times. So there was not a big full fledged push with the project. And a lot of things just didn't line up. Like there was a time around 2006 where zero had got out of jail for a short amount of time. And he went right back to jail. So he did that verse and then I think he violated and then he had to go right back to jail. So I think he was out maybe two weeks or something like that. Mm. And, you know, the funny story is we were actually getting ready to leave the studio the night that, um, that um, we worked on the song with Zero. We had already did the beat for our artist, but we stopped, um, we basically took the beat and gave it to him to, to the guy Info, he had another verse on there. And Horse was like, man, Horseman was like, man, y'all pull up that, pull up that gun talk, man. We were leaving the studio. He's like, what's up, man, where y'all going? We was like, we finna leave, man. We were just um, getting ready. We just came up here for a minute. We weren't gonna stay. Then, you know, shortly coming right behind him, we were like zero. It was like, oh shit, hey, what's going on, man? Nice to meet you. He's like, hey, hey, Duke, because that's what people call me. They call me Duke or Big Duke. That's my, that's how people know me. If you know me, you know me. They'll call me Duke or Big Duke. <laughs> so we were leaving. Like I said, he was like, what's up, man? Where y'all going? I was like, uh, we're going to leave, man. We're going to get up out of here. You know, because you get kind of burnt out from that same rotation. I had just got off of work. I was tired as a dog. I was working at Smoothie King. I was wearing my purple shirt and my Smoothie King shirt and everything. He was like, man, like, like, man, wait, I'm, I'm gonna need y'all, man. I'm gonna need y'all to uh, work on this song, man. Uh, uh, go ahead, pull up that gun talk, you know? So this is my first time recording somebody that was not one of my artists or somebody that I was working with. You know, this is like a real rapper. This is like, I hate you, bitch, Zero. <laughs> this is like a, a local legend. You know what I mean? He, um, in his, he, this is like slow, loud, and banging all in my trunk, Zero. Like that, like he, that was at his mixtape peak. You know what I mean? He was like, like on, on. But even though, and then his lure grew because he had, um, he had did the videos from jail and he was in jail. It, you know, I, I don't know if you remember that specific time. It was funny because we did, I didn't know where he was at, but he came in real professional. He actually showed me how to record people that rap fast. You know, he knows how to count his bars. Everybody, that's something that's special. Counting your bars, everybody can't do it. You know, knowing the specific frame of the song that you want to rap on everybody can't do that wow. so he he actually um came in and he didn't put me through a ringer but he let me know that the first take he's a perfectionist he showed me professional um how to how to really record and he's like no let's do it again let's do it again and i was like Okay, that sounds good. Cause this everything I hear him all, everything this is zero. Everything sounds good to me. Right. But zero, he was like, "No, nah, let me do it again. Let me do it again." Like he was trying to get those those bars down. Then he would do four bars, stop, let the music keep playing, do the next four bars, stop, and so on and so forth. Cause he was rapping fast on this particular song, and he was just like, "You basically basically just filling in the spots." And it was real easy. And it's not like regular Zero. He's not singing on there. He's rapping. And he's not rapping like on any other song that he's ever done. 
He's not singing and doing his Rotha Vandross stuff like that. He just spitting bars. He's got that bone influence in him. So he's rapping just like, lights come red, don't stop, nigga, run it, come to Jack's at the gas, nigga. Just, he just ripping our beat apart. And that was the, uh, the next thing. He was like rapping on our beat. I'm recording him and he's rapping on a beat that we made. I was like, boy, we supposed to be famous. <laughs> it, it, wasn't like, it wasn't like famous, famous, but you know, it was cool. It was a good experience. That was a good um, experience for me um, with regards to working with somebody that had a good experience. How did we get to this conversation? Wow. No, that was actually going to be the next question that I asked you about one of the ups that you've had in working in this industry. Um, and you answered it before I could ask you. Thank you. You were well, in my mind. What did I say? <laughs> working I with Zero. Well, you know, it kind of led into working with Zero, but in addition to working with Zero was about 97.9, um, hearing your beat on the radio. Um, so, and then of course, working with Zero and, and meeting him and having him rap on your beat. So, uh, well, are there any other ups? that you've had like well i mean there's not a lot of downs the thing is the thing i will i will talk about the negatives and the positives of working with with um working on an independent uh working on an independent level we still work on an independent level most of the time the artists that they're not very organized they don't really know what to do. And what I mean by that, they don't know how to register their music. They don't have people uh, that will educate them with regards to their publishing, sound exchange, um, ISRC codes, things like that. Those th th things that are important to help you monetize your music. You know, we don't really have in Houston a lot of people that will um, that will try to get your music to the um, to the big publishers and stuff like that. I look at a person like Toby in Nigue, and he's he was independent, but he's still flourishing i'm not sure if he's independent now but he's flourishing working with people like ea sports or 2k you know he's making money just trying to hustle his music online or trying to be famous only on instagram and stuff like that he is in those platforms you know, Instagram or whatnot, but that's, he's making money performing. He's a great performer. A lot of artists don't know how to perform. That's another down, a negative of uh, working with artists that are independent. They don't have any training. You know how you would look at, um, I'll think back to the times where there was Motown. They had performance training, interview training, things like that. <clears throat> You know, I, I, would, I used to perform with my artists. When, I would, when we had shows at the Jet Lounge and, and uh, they changed it, Studio T-Town. I don't know, what did they call T-Town now? What was T-Town? Uh, Warehouse oh, Lounge? I was uh, sheltered as a child and... Um... I sound so old, man. <laughs> <laughs> But there's a there's a spot right over there for Richmond and Hillcroft. Uh -huh. And um they used to um throw performances, you know. We used to go through Afton. Afton was like a it's basically like a they we they would give us tickets. We have to sell a certain amount of tickets, then they'll pay us for those performances. Um and we would perform at these places, but prior to those performances we would practice we would make sure that we were all in sync we wearing the right clothes are we together um 
it's just so much. Jesus, I could talk all day. We probably need about an eight hour interview. Man. Yeah, I know, right? It's right. definitely an eight hour interview. <laughs> well, like, we just need to talk. Like, it just needs to be a conversation. Yeah, because I feel I feel like I'm just all over the place, and I'm so. No, like you're I said, I'm, actually doing great. You are. I'm doing in my own head. Like I said, we're Aries, so we kind of just are like all over the place. But we're a harder on ourselves than anybody else will ever be. But mm-hmm. there's, you know, there's so much to talk about with negativity. You know, the 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 positive thing working with artists is that, you know. The main thing for me, working with artists, I like to see their growth and I like to see their happiness. Because the thing is, you don't really see that with artists from, um, from you know, that just come out of the nowhere. We don't see how they developed from being that person to the person that they are when they are on a label. You know what I mean? You just yeah. like like it's like a person like a Travis Scott. I'll use him as an example. I didn't I don't know anything about him prior to um you know prior to his project out. I don't know if he was recording music, you know, prior to that. But I do know that I heard about that pro the Al Pharaoh, I believe it's called. And then he did Days Before Rodeo. Then after that bam, rodeo hits. Then you hear antidote everywhere. I'm like, damn. But I didn't know anything about him. I didn't know his background. I like to work with guys that will, that I can see their growth um, from a, you know, from a personal standpoint. Because most of the people that I have worked with, a lot of them I have personal good relationships with especially the ones that have been recurring over and over and over I have clients that I've worked with from you know since we started the studio 2008 when we first started charging people I have people that were will come over and they're still coming since 2009 2010 I have some really good clients as a matter of fact one of the artists that I work with um the last artist that I started to develop J.R. Houston He's actually one of my last clients that I brought on to my team. And he's somebody that I'm working with um, to this day. Uh, He's somebody that has really matured and grown up in front of me. And now he's a um, part owner of of his own business. You know, he's part owner of Poor Behavior, like right there downtown. Um, I just like to see when you take someone on as a client what does that look like uh, for you what does that necessarily what does that mean you said when I take someone on as a client Mm -hmm. really you know I don't run I have not run ads which is something that's going to change here soon but most of my clients are word of mouth there's somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody. So that's how I normally get, um, you know, my, um, my clients. And I think a lot of my clients, they qualify me. They like, man, when you go in there working with Derek, man, you gotta be ready. You gotta be ready. Cause he gonna, he ain't gonna play with you. And I think they kind of scare him too. <laughs> you know, cause you know, here I am some big old dude. 6'1", 327 pounds, big fella, dark skin. People think that I'm gonna be some mean dude. I'm like, bro, I'm not I'm not that guy, bro. I'm cool, you know. You're 6'1", I'm 5'2". <laughs> yes. Okay, 5'1 and a half. But that that it's cool. that it's half an up. inch, yeah, I know. Thank you. Yeah. It's cool. <laughs> but yeah, man, people they um a lot of my clients are word of mouth, most of them. I've had maybe like one or two that were called because I don't really answer my phone just for anybody because people are weird, you know? People are weird. And I'm noticing that every single day. So, you know, we could talk, I can even try to talk a little politics, but anyway, we don't mm. <laughs> But uh, yeah, man, most of my so clients- 
or yeah, just fr friends of family or friends of friends of friends. Mm. Mm -hmm. So you were saying before we actually started recording uh, this episode about your studio and your reason for um, making the studio with uh, which I guess I should mention that you're located in Houston because you know this <laughs> we are now on the internet and so that could be anywhere right but right. Uh, so for purposes of of people who um, want to know how you started your studio your reason for starting your studio what what are those for starting um the recording studio okay so but well, we're in stafford i do want to kind of clarify that because we're in the houston area southwest uh, houston area we're in stafford we're located right off of murphy road 610 murphy road number 110 stafford texas 77477 i have to give that information because i don't want to short myself but and we're an appointment only studio be mindful of that don't just pop up over here because you're gonna get looked at funny okay <laughs> All you people, don't just pop up. <laughs> don't be outside just looking. Cause we, you know. But all right, so the reason that we had a studio is because all right, so this we were recording and doing things in the house. We were at my mom's house. And sometimes we would go to my grandmother's house and record. I had a, a computer there where I could record. Um, so there was a situation there. You know how blacks is going black, you know? Blacks going black. They're going black, man. <laughs> I'm telling you. Um, sometimes people, you give people an opportunity and it's like they want to play with you. And it's like, fam. So we really <laughs> developed, we got a studio with some partners um, just so that we could uh, really not have that traffic in our residence. You know, you have to protect yourself. We really, and then, like I said, we didn't start the recording studio to um, charge people. We were specifically trying to do the bad boy thing or the death row thing and develop our talents, develop our production styles, you know, grow talent, work with as much local talent as possible. You know, this is like a few years after we had worked with Zero and Chopper Style and like I said, Lennox, and we were working with other guys that were, um, that were coming up. We had a very, very, very brief period where we actually had the studio with um, a guy named Jaquay Jackson and he had brought ill-fated um, Jose on. So um, we were very, very, very brief partners with them. But, you know, like I said, things just did not work out. But from there, we, we've had a few studios over here in this area in this specific um, complex. But um, how do I segue? But we were more comfortable working with myself and my partner, you know, because we're like brothers. We were friends since ninth grade. And then we actually come to find out years later on down the line that we're actually related through family down the line, you know? So we, um, we're just more comfortable working with each other. You know, we've had our ups and downs with other people working with them, but it's, it's just best that we work amongst each other, you know, to keep it short as short as I can. I know I'll be talking a lot. Mm -hmm. No, you're good. So you mentioned um, about being an affordable uh, studio and having that that accessibility for you not to have to hit independent artists over the head. 
right. um, with uh, for a large amount of money in the beginning, <laughs> of course, like, you know. Well, right now it's still pretty affordable. I mean, I'm not charging $75 an hour. I charge $50 an hour. That's good, especially yeah. for the product that we're giving. That you. is really good. That's really you know, good. For right now. So what, all, what services do you offer as, um, as, you know, not only a producer, but also with Black Label? Well, we offer recording time. Like I said, we're a recording studio. We, we offer mixing, mastering services. Um, and, you know, we, we have to kind of gauge you to produce for you. You know, I've worked with, it, I've worked with artists like um, M's Up Milo. I worked on like, I produced three songs on his project, Dickies and Chucks. Um, I worked with a guy by the name of Easy Money Wop. Not sure if you ever heard of him, but you know, I did a couple projects on his, uh, I did a couple songs on his project called 803 Orange Circle. And they were actually recording here first, more specifically Watt. Um, he was recording here like every two, three days he was here in the studio. He was just up here. I'm like, bro, go home. You know, he was up here a lot. But he was, he was like, man, I'm trying to put this project together. I was like, man, maybe I can run something together for him. And I actually did the project for him well, recorded it, mixed it, mastered it. And then I did a little bit of production on it too. I did two, two tracks for him. I did the title track and I did the song called Winning for him. So, and depending on other services you need, I don't do everything, but I have people that I'll consult with. Like, I'm not sure if you heard of a young lady by the name of Jocity Management, Jock City Management or Jocklin. She works closely with me sometimes. So if a person needs like their split sheets done or if they need to try to get their music registered, that's somebody that I'll reach out to. To I'll lead the artist to her so that they can get their music administration done. You know, so she's not directly a part of, she's not a business partner of mine, but I do work through her to help artists to get that type of work done. You know, but more specifically, I try to do the blue collar work here at the studio, which is the recording, mixing, mastering, you know, even the singing part. I'll even try to help you to sing your part out. Um, on Milo's project, on M's Up Milo's project, I sang on a song called M's Up Pose Down. Let me make sure, hold on, let me just make sure that's the name of it. Let me see. Yeah, it's called M's Up, Hoes Down. And I sang on there. I'm featured on the song. So I sing a little bit too. Wow. But I'm not just like no singer, you know what I mean? I can just do a little bit of um, holding a note. A little holding a note. Yeah. I, I feel yeah, like I you're being humble. You know what? <laughs> I'll say this. I try Go ahead, to sing that key sweat. Drop that key sweat. No, one nah, time. Baby, nah, baby. Okay. Yeah, no. <laughs> nah, you got me. Look at you. <laughs> nah, man. But look, I'll be honest with you. In the eighth grade, after football and basketball was over, I um I had to um go to another elective. And the elective I went to, I chose, well, I, I was in the band, but you know, I couldn't afford an instrument. So they put me in choir. And um, from there, I, I didn't know anything about singing at all. I didn't know the notes, but I had a teacher by the name of Joanne Gobert. And she would get on the piano and do the, e -e 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 -e. Mm -hmm. you know, so I would do that in the eighth grade. And I'm in there. I'm like, it's a bunch of women in here. It's a bunch of these little young ladies in here. <laughs> and my little uh, 13 to 14 year old self, 
I was like, okay, I can get used You're to like, this. You're like, okay. Yeah, I can get used to just like me and probably eight up. dudes and like 20 girls. Wow. And so I was like outnumbered in a good way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, my girlfriend sat next to me because I was in, in the base tenor section and she was like right next to me as a soprano. Mm. So soprano, bass, tenor, and um, alto to our to our left like if i was looking at you but from there um this is probably 1995-96 my favorite rap group of all time is bone thugs and harmony oh you know i've been going down okay i'm sorry that's all the best. Subject, but i've that's been going through their catalog like i've never actually i have my favorite songs but i've never actually listened to like all the way through some of their older albums black back when they were bone enterprise right right yes right. slow motion all of that <laughs> yeah slow motion yeah slow motion yes i'm a i'm a bone fan like i'm telling uh, you I is it slow motion or slow motion low motion slow motion yeah, it's dude. the first song on the bone enterprise yeah album. See, I could like I could talk about a bunch of different stuff. Here. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> you know sorry. what I'm saying? So we can like I could just yeah, like, bone thugs, bone thugs. My, that yeah. is my group, and to me, um, they were like the best thing of all time because they were different. They, it, they, they were, they rap fast, they were smooth, and they were singing. They was going over good production. So mm -hmm. before I knew anything about making beats or production or anything, I was like, this shit is genius. How do you do mm -hmm. that? Like the multi-layered tra <laughs> tracks and all of that. I yes. was like, bro, how do they drag their voice like that? Yes. Like, what is going on? Thinking my, about my probably... favorite screw song, uh, screwed up regular song is Breakdown uh, with Mariah Carey. And it was just the way that they put together that track i love it anyway and then screw got a hold of it and it just he did his oh my god that song mm. i could just listen to on repeat all day long just that one song you know what i'm gonna say it like this this is how strong bone was and i know people talk about wu-tang and outcast but even on dj screw's most popular mixtape june 27th the first song on there after Ice T stopped talking is Crossroads, the original Crossroads. And while it even though Screw just kept mm, bringing that mm, home back, mm, I was like, bro, mm, this dude mm, is mm, filthy mm. with the hands, man. With then, the hands. Then, oh my go, God. Go, go. You still got bones, bro. Man. man, he was chopping that mug up so good. To ever do it. Best right. to ever do it. I, I was gonna ask you um so uh, at the time of this recording we are uh not completely in the clear from COVID-19 uh shutdowns and you know capacity you know gotta watch your capacity um for everybody who's coming through so how how have you been able to navigate as running a studio, having some of that income have to come from running a studio? And what precautions are you taking for people who are coming in now? Well, I mean, for myself specifically, um, I have to be more than cautious because I'm like three times higher risk. I'm a diabetic, high blood pressure, you know, and, you know, a lot of, you know, I'm just out here. So I have to wear yeah. a mask. I got to have my hand sanitizer. I spray the studio. I spray the mics down and I wear a mask. I have to make sure I'm protecting myself because if I don't, you know, I run the, I'm risking my life. And it's uh, it has slowed me down in the way that um, I'm I'm not able to uh, really get in here and have a lot of traffic the way I want to. You know, a lot of the people that come in there repeats. 
you know, and some of the people that I love, man, that I've spent time with, folks that I've spent a lot of time with recording, like I was telling you about my guy, J.R. Houston, he actually um, had family that had the COVID. So I had to kind of monitor the way I was spending time with him because, you know, I don't know if he had it or anything yeah. like that. And then a, a per, the person that was in here doing my remodeling, he's a family member of mine, but he got COVID. Mm. You know, but he's okay. And I had another cousin that was like, he had sarcoidosis. The same thing, Crazy Bone has this. Bernie Beck had it, and that's what he died from because it, it makes your lungs weak. And Mark, this specifically family, this specific family member of mine was in the hospital for like four months. Mm -hmm. So I have to be more than careful with regards to it. So I, I spend, a, I'm spending more time by myself. People there, they can, they need to do something. They'll mail it in to me. They'll email it to me, and I still record, but I just take my time with regards to um, just getting people in here and trying to do everything. I can't I can't run my business that way. Yeah, because I have to watch out for myself. A lot of people don't believe it, but I know people that have lost their family. I know, I've known people who actually caught it. And it's like, how do you not believe something that clearly people around you are getting? If if no one around me was getting it, I'd be like, okay, well, I guess it's not hitting us. <laughs> it's not well, you know what? The, the main thing that we can do and I'm going to listen to the director of the CDC with this. I'm not paying attention to Doc, to Donald Trump. I'm going to <laughs> I'm going to wear my mask, especially right. if, if you're someone that I do not know. And when I do have people come, you know, make sure that you're wearing your mask. You know, I have a little distance. I have like stools so that people can sit on the stools. I took one of my couches out of here because all of that breathing, and then I'm right here in the middle. It's like, bro. Right. Like, yeah, <laughs> All yeah. that breathing. Yep. You know? So a lot of times I I have to just do the right thing. Clean up, spray down. And I'm looking at my place right now because I'm getting ready to have somebody to come through. But I make sure that I'm taking care of you know, all the surface areas. I'm opening the door and closing the door for people so that they're not touching the knobs and all of that. Mm. Don't touch the microphone stand. Don't do it. Because <laughs> let me do it. I'm the one. That, that's my job. Yeah. But in actuality, I'm protecting myself because I don't want other people touching. You and know. you're protecting the people who come in after that person. Absolutely. Uh, protecting anyone who comes in after if for whatever reason you can't get to every single place that they put their hands on. Right. And now, you know, the temperature has been dropped. You know, Houston with this crazy weather, bro, all of these allergies and stuff is like just they just like coming out of the woodworks and it's like yes. I'm over here. You hear me over here sniffing, yes. trying to bite my nose. I'm like, that rag oh, weed every few has minutes. been crazy lately. Man, I love the temperature drop, but come on, bro. I can't. I I'm like in my boosy voice. Come on, man. <laughs> come on. Come on, dog. Like, well, I wanted to ask you. Uh, I know you have a session coming up here soon, but I wanted to ask you um, another question. So. Part of um, this show, I always ask my guest, what is some good advice that you can give um, to someone who is navigating the rocky road, the ups and the downs of the industry as an independent artist? So one, you can speak on two parts, but for one, uh, as an independent music artist, and also some advice that you could give a producer who might be either just starting out or trying to survive the, the shutdowns, and what's some advice that you can give those two 
groups of people? Well, one thing that I can always tell people is to be a very, be very aware of how you take in information. A lot of people are very sensitive. Like Erica Badu says, I'm an artist and I'm sensitive about my shit. You know, the thing is, I've had to learn growing. You, you, you know, I'm a producer, but it don't give me the right to talk to people like Diddy and stuff. You understand? So be very mindful about how you speak to people. And I'll tell you like this, because I used to work in a, a call center. It was not a call center. It was um, Blue Cross Blue Shield Anthem. And I would speak to providers all the time on the phone. One thing it taught me is to do, it was to be polite. Always say please and thank you to people. And I've ta I take that with me every single where I go. Excuse me. You know, just be very polite to people. Be nice to folks. Keep your emotions in check. That's something that people do not know how to do. They have a very hard time um, taking in information. They're very sensitive about their work. And additionally, they don't know how to reciprocate when someone is polite to them. You see somebody that, you know, they get treated very well, but then they think that that, that person that's treating them well is soft, which is not true. People just are polite. And if you want to be remembered and you want to be, um, if you want your memory to be cherished, then treat people well. I know a lot of artists that didn't do anything because they were just shitty individuals. They steal from the people that'll do anything for them. You know, make sure that you're taking care of your business. Um, in, in regards to like a producer, I'll say as a producer, try to stay, if you can, and I'll just say this for our culture period, black people, if your parents allow you to save up your money you know, buy equipment, buy it slowly, but save up your bread. You know, get as much money as you can because you don't know what's, what's going to be the next thing that's going to happen. I mean, I hear a lot of talented producers that they, they don't really know how to make their music sound good because they haven't been taught. So invest in yourself. It's, it's, I could talk so much about just making personal investments. You know, even over the pandemic, you know, I took a, another mastering class to learn how to master at a very professional level, not just putting a limiter on the master bus. You know, invest in your, yourself, invest in your microphones, invest in your speakers. And I'm pointing at this stuff because I'm just looking around my place. You know, buy things that are going to help you. Um, what else? What else can advice can, you know, just be receptive as well. You know, I was not always good. I don't know if you ever heard of this guy named Muhammad Tuji. You heard of him? Okay, so he's got this song called Don't You Go Nowhere. The beats of the album. Now, a guy that was my manager at Smoothie King, he was managing him. Very good producer, awesome. He worked with Whitney Houston. He did the song called, Why You Looking At Me? Don't Be Mad At Me. This is a song about Whitney Houston. And this song has little offset dancing in the video. So it's called, Why You Looking At Me by Whitney Houston. Go check it out. It was produced by Muhammad 2G. Um, but he gave me some very, very solid advice. And I took that and I made sure that I wasn't sensitive. He said, make sure your beats are good. Like the drums are good, but make sure you're putting music into your actual production. And there's a difference. There's good music. And then there's like off key music. You can just have a bunch of keyboard sounds out here just 
thrown together. And that's what I was missing. I didn't have good music. So what I did, that's why I got with my business partner. We had been friends, but I didn't know that he played the piano. So he would play the keys on the music. And that's how our relationship has built over, over time. Like if we need to get in here and work on something specifically, he's gonna come in here, bam, he's gonna hit those keys on the on the um, keyboard. And I'm as soon as he starts working, my brain is programming drums. My mind is already working. It's like we can kind of feel each other. It's like we're together, but we breathe in the same breath. You feel me? If, if that's the way I, I could um, describe it. You gotta be on the same frequency as the person that you're working with. So be receptive. If I don't like something, he doesn't take it personally. You know, don't be overly sensitive about things, man. When people say something, they're not just saying things just because they that's they are going based off what they first hear. Everybody didn't like Bone at first. Everybody, I'm sure they didn't like Outkast. I, you know, I still have my issues with Wu Tang. I don't like them niggas like that. They got some good songs, but yeah, I'm gonna stop right there with regards to going in on these guys and who people think are the best. Yeah, I could like, I'm, you know, I really need to um, do uh, uh, my own like special guest uh, or my special list. Like, who's the best rapper in your? Who's the best top five albums in your in your playlist? You know, yes, but I'm gonna stop right should. there. I'm gonna stop. I mean, when I say I'm gonna stop right there, it's just like I'm not gonna go in how I want to. Right. You know, because I know well, I could really talk for like two hours, three, four <laughs> hours. My battery is going to die. Oh, no, 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 no. And like I said, I know you have um, a um, a session coming up here in a minute, but mm -hmm. I just want to say thank you so much, Derek, for yes, coming on the show, for investing this time in between sessions. And I really do appreciate you for what you're doing for independent artists and their communities. I, you know what? I really want to do more. I want to be more available, you know, and I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to um, actually get here and talk. This is my first time in a long time actually doing an interview. I was... Um, I'm actually getting ready to prep myself to put myself out there a little bit more. Cause like I said, we've been pretty much word of mouth, but it's time for me to put the pedal to the metal and really go all the way in. I this mean, is a lot a perfect of, year for it. It's right. a perfect year for it. Right. And I, I'll say it like this. I was actually working um, up until February you know, so I was still staying busy. All of the time, all of the things that I made mention of working with Milo, working with um, DeLorean, this is stuff that I was doing during the week after I get off of work. You know what I mean? After I get off work, I would come up here and start working with the with, with this talent so that I could, um, you know, it wasn't just the extra money. I just need to keep my tools sharp. You know, working with artists makes me better as an engineer. So I, it, 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 um, I really have to um, really push forward now yeah. so that I can, everything that I've worked on now is time for me to start putting it all together and start just running this, like running it hard, running it, um, with a specific goal in mind, because I don't plan on being in this position forever. I really right. want to start, it's time for me to start living off of what my real gift is, you know? Yes. And, and that could be a reason why 2020 made us all st take a step back and do a lot of reflection. And, and that's uh, what I've been doing. That's the reason that yeah. I did all this, because if I was working, I would not have had time to do all of the changes and stuff to my studio to make yeah. the actually the actual investments because a lot of the it's not about the money most of the time it's about the time 
Mm. It's the time that you have to do it. And I know you asked about the um about um advice. Make sure you're putting time into your craft. This is in artists that are really wanting to do this, you have to grind it out. ESG was probably um, independent for a few years. I mean, he was probably on a label for a few years and Priority actually runs like an independent, you know? They just basically give you that push. I know he was on Priority when he did Sell in the South. Is, is that right? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think so. All right, yeah, so he did sell in the South, but pr prior to that was Ocean of Funk. But man, they was out here, man. They was working hard, busting their ass. Independently, when they had Southwest Wholesale, there was so much that you could do as an independent artist. Now you can't, you don't really have that ability to go hand to hand CD with CD, a CD hand to hand with. And then they just were like in a pocket. I don't know, man. They they was like you talked about D Rick, like with Fat Pat, man. That that is probably the best screwed up click album of all times. That Ghetto Dreams. That's man. They were like in a pocket, man. And they were it was good music, and it, that music was so good that it's still good today. I could talk, man, I could talk about the time I met Screw, man, but I'm not going to keep on. I could just talk about a bunch of stuff, man. Mm, well, we're, you're going to have to come back for part two. Man, You're going to have to come back for part two, for real. Hey, Wendy, I'm going to have to really, like, write down my answers for you <laughs> or, so that I can kind of, like, keep a timeline. I, I really should start writing a book. Mm, I don't know who's going to want to hear the story. You should. I don't have no fans. <laughs> yes, you do. We all have fans. Yeah. All of us on social media and in the music industry have fans. All of us do. Yeah. You're right. But I just, it's time to start really telling our stories. Yes. And I'm ready. Yes. But yeah, I got to be more, um, my brain is like everywhere. No, it's all good. And like I said, thank you so much for, you know, coming on here, dropping this knowledge for both independent music artists and producers. And uh, guys, download Crowded Streaming, please. Uh, the app independent for independent music artists, black owned, they pay for your streams. Um, and yeah, that's how does it. one um, get the music to them? I'm gonna guess me and you, we're gonna talk like I'm gonna make sure that you you get all of that information right after hey, this. I'm gonna need it because I'm ready to start dropping music <laughs> in as a producer as well. Yes. So, yeah. It's time. What, what I'm going to do, we're going to exchange information for sure. I'm glad of that course. you had me on. Well, actually, I want to, you know, make sure that people know how to contact you directly if they want to book um, a studio session with you um, or check out anything or even, you know, reach out to you for advice. If they want to reach out to me on Facebook, uh, my name is Derek Rhodes, D-E-R-R-Y-K, last name R-H-O-D-E-S. Um, on Instagram, you can find me with the same name, or but my at is The Black Label Truth. You can find me there. I'm not on Twitter a lot, but it's just Black Label Truth there. You can find me by my name um, as well. Um, pretty much those are the ways that you can reach out to me. Um, my phone number. I don't know if I want to get at a. All get good, it? all good. They can email you or hop yes. in the DM. Well, right. thank you guys so much for tuning in to the Rocky Road uh, with Derek Rhodes. Road Rhodes. <laughs> yes, ma'am. And uh, until next time, episode oh. four, y'all. Episode four. <laughs> Let me know if you start recording. <laughs>